So uh, Brady first asked me to do a, a talk on uh, game mechanics, which I thought is, was pretty, pretty funny because we're not a game. Uh, we're not a game at all, but we are the most fun way that you can commute. And I think that this has been part of the reason uh, that uh, we're starting to become uh, known. Now, the thing about uh, these applications is that getting to critical mass is a hard, uh, a hard problem to solve. And it's one thing when we're talking about how much data we can collect. We're all talking about big data. We know that sensors give us a tremendous amount of information more than ever before. Still, when we're talking about one city, one point in time, we're talking about real time. To get enough information at a place and a time is incredibly difficult. So we've integrated game mechanics into the platform as a core part of our product as a way to make getting to function fun. But the, the path, the point, is always about the function, which is helping people get to where they want to go uh, from point A to point B at this point in time. So the game mechanics are only about that. So in addition to the game mechanics, there's one other thing that's, that's been really helpful in getting to this level of density, and I'll just review it quickly. Um, so uh, I think it was Brad Horowitz, when he was at Yahoo, studying Yahoo groups, uh, came up with the 1%, 10%, and 89% and, and theory about communities, right? 1% does a lot of the heavy lifting. They're the big contributors. 10% are doing things like voting and rating and reviewing. And then you've got the 89%, which are typically passively consuming that information. So if you want to really leverage and really get to, to the core of the density of information, one of the questions is, how do you turn that 89% of consumers into contributors. So the sensor allows that to happen. That little square in the corner uh, is where we were before 2004, right? And uh, just to step back, it's when maps and location really came from tainted pictures, uh, really uh, pretty much uh, we had a view of the world that was only from, from governments that was uh, dictated to us by the superior. And now, in the last uh, even six years, we've gone to a place where crowdsourcing has really changed our view of the world. Uh, before this time, we didn't have the iPhone, we didn't have Androids, we didn't even have Google Maps APIs to allow people to contribute that information. So it's an incredibly uh, big set, set of changes that's happened. And now, of course, we're getting to that density. And one of the things we do at Waze is try to figure out, again, take that 89% and turn it into people that are contributing. So just for context, what we do, uh, we are navigation and uh, real-time traffic for mobile devices. It's a free application for most of the smartphone platforms, and it's entirely crowdsourced. We have now uh, approaching 3.5 million drivers around the world who are using the application, and all they have to do is turn it on. When they turn it on while they're driving, we're collecting the GPS traces, we're collecting the timestamps, and from that, we're creating the actual map itself. It's our map created by the community. We're creating all of the traffic information that sits on top, and then all of the social and hazards and incidents and reports. So you can also actively report on things like police, um, hazards, traffic jams, that kind of thing. So uh, when you're going from something to nothing, here are the steps that we looked at, right? So first you have to build it. You can't, you know, if you're starting with an empty map, you're not going to be able to get to the value of how do I get from point A to point B, right? So uh, for us, that was uh, the building up of the road grid itself, using these GPS traces in the community. So how do you make that process fun? Well, uh, it's a pretty gratifying experience to be able to turn on an application and watch yourself in real time create the roads that everyone else around you is going to see the next day. So um, just incorporating a bit of fun into that building process, that first step, is what helped us get people to trial. Uh, and then you've got you know, the play phase, which is, okay, you don't really have a lot of value, uh, but at least you can see the roads around you. You can start to see other people uh, in your proximity. Uh, but what we, what we were doing there was trying to figure out how do you take a static road grid and turn that into a navigable map? Well, again, we have the GPS traces and timestamps, so you need to make it fun for people to be the first one, ones to drive down a road, right? To be able to uh, take a right, and then we can open up a turn restriction to collect the speed information so that we can understand when there's traffic and, and not traffic. Then you start to get to the value, right? Where your service is pretty good. You're going to get a dependable route from A to B. You might even get the fastest route. And you know, from, from what I hear, uh, more and more people have been putting us up against uh, Google and some of the paid services and finding that in obscure places, they're even able to get, get there. So we've, uh, in that phase, what you see is a lot of people using the service and 
the, the play is what's allowed people to use the service on a daily basis because the use is, is, is critical. Uh, and then you get to critical mass where you start thinking about how do you monetize this. Um, and in Israel where the company was founded, 10% of the entire population, not the driving population, the population uses Waze. Um, and so very, very interesting things start to happen. We're able to make money off of licensing the data and we're able to make money off of location, what we call location guided advertising. We're starting to see this in other countries happen as well. And I would say in many metros in the US, we're in the value phase already approaching critical mass. Um, but at the root of this, right, what we have is a community of drivers. We have people that are incentivized by their participation in the community. They know that everything they do is about making the service better for everyone else and themselves. Uh, and then so where the game mechanics come in is that tied into all of this as a platform for play. How do you make what you, you need to have happen just a bit more fun? It's not about sticking achievements where they don't belong. I think the game mechanics thing is so hyped right now that there's a pressure for everyone in the room to figure out how to gamify their service. And it's really not about that. It's about how do you get to value and are there ways to remove barriers and friction to get people along that process. Um, so road munching. Uh, when we were in the, the just going from the build to the play phase, what you needed to do is get people to drive down roads. So as you're driving down, if you're the first wazer to drive a road, your icon turns into a Pac-Man and you collect points. Uh, for, for going down these roads. And it's different in different countries, but about three to 5% of our audience uh, actually participated in, in pac manning and they got points for this. Then we found that that, that was really successful in, in pretty much mapping the entire world and then people were like, now what? Right? It's also important to note that as we've architected this, this play into the product, this platform, we didn't have it architected from the beginning. Everything's been driven by what do people do, what do they need, and how are we gonna make our service better? Every single decision. So we started sprinkling road goodies around in areas where we didn't have the freshest information. And what we found is that a certain number of people will go a small bit out of their way uh, to get a cupcake or a heart for Valentine's Day, and in exchange, uh, they get points, we get the better data, and so does everyone else in the community. So about eight to 12 people have experienced that. Brady was very, very clear that he didn't want me to just share experiences where we were successful and everything's been so perfect, and, uh, right? So it's very, very clunky. For example, we, uh, we, we, we always play with the distribution algorithm for these road goodies, right? So it started off more just where we didn't have fresh data. Now we're understanding driving patterns and how far will you drive. Um, so when we were playing with that, oftentimes people would get experiences like this. Um, that's not a valuable map at all. You can't see the map, you can't see the city names, you can't see the traffic, and people are like, what the hell is this? This is not navigation, I can't commute like this. And at that point, we realized that, okay, it's possible for this platform for play to detract value. Uh, and so with the co community, we got that feedback and uh, that was a fail. So eight to 12%, then what we wanted to do was see, all right, what if we make this a little bit more event-based? Uh, what if we condense the time and for, for a period of time there are special things that are happening? This was for the World Cup and people could, uh, from munching, certain, uh, munching soccer balls, uh, they would be able to be entered to win an, uh, an iPad. During that campaign, I think it was about 10 days, 20% of our unique drivers during that period actually played the game. So we got from three to 5% to eight to 12%, to now we're at 20%, and 78% of the kilometers driven in that period were from people who played the game. So pretty close to an 80-20. So similarly with how do you get, uh, you know, with sensor information, people to go from um, consumers of data to contributors of data, we wanted to figure out how do you get 20, you know, from 20% of people engaging in gameplay to 100%, and so we built in the notion of achievements. Again, it was the same reward structure the whole time. It's still the building up of these points. Um, and it was, uh, I think the, the first achievement we added was driving your first five miles. There was a business need to get people to not just download the application to check it out, but to drive with it. So incentivize that first action, and it, it was the first time we took these uh, game mechanics, if you will, and made it very personal to your own set of achievements. But again, it was everything about making the system better. Um, three weeks ago, we did our first um, add-on to that, which is um, the location-guided advertising in the US. 
Nintendo launched their 3DS recently, and uh, we were part of that campaign. They launched the 3DS on Waze, uh, and it was a, a very brief campaign, again, this event-based model that attempted to get people from wherever they are into one of the few retailers that was demoing uh, the 3DS for the launch events. So we were actually driving people to retail. It was a fairly small test. It was about 80, 80, retailer, uh, 80 locations in the US. And you saw Mario when you opened up your application. If you clicked on Mario, your map would pan to, uh, to the nearest location. Only people who were in proximity saw this. Um, and then if you clicked to navigate, you had a series of, um, of road goodies that mirrored the Mario experience, the mushroom, the power-up star, et cetera. If you made it all the way to the final one, which was at the retail location, you were entered to win a 3DS or other prizes. 6.3% um, of all unique drivers made it to retail. This is crazy. Often in location-based advertising, we like the idea of a 6% click rate, right? That when you're on a mobile device, you can, that, that even sounds really great. 6% of people made it to their destination, the retailer. So we're pretty excited about that. So you can monetize this stuff too. Another fail uh, was during that same campaign, a number of people attempted to get their final prize. They had, they had driven all of this way, and we found out that there was a bug in the system based on an enhancement we made <laughs> just recently to stick people to roads so you didn't have these disconnects when you were on highways that actually made it um, for a couple of hours in the program impossible to get some of these road goodies, and we really made a lot of people angry. Uh, we made it up to them, and um, now we have a better system for it. <laughs> Okay, so feedback is another important part. Uh, people are always asking me, what do you do with the points, right? Why, why do you care about the points? Why would people do this? And you know, so at the beginning, it was just about seeing where you ranked within the community. You could see people nearby you and uh, see you know, who's the top driver. Then we incorporated the ability to compete against your friends, and that became enough. Uh, and then again, you could keep track of your own points for this. It's important to note that everything you do on the system, whether it's report an accident or actually edit the map, has a point mechanism tied to it. So it's a single system of rewards. Um, and that, that had seemed to be enough. But the main thing for us is we don't want to incentivize people with being able to convert that to cash. What's the real motivation here? And every point you earn um, is about building a better service for everybody else. And we want that front and center. We don't want to be able to give you, you know, just some random prize for that. The reward that we offer people is greater weight within the community. And this is tangible. Uh, so if you're a five-star user, you have a lot of points, uh, it would take five one-star users, for example, to overturn your reports or your edits to the community. Uh, so there really is a lot of weight you carry by being a contributing member of this community. Um, and of course, you can do fun things too. You know, we're tied into Twitter and Foursquare, and you can get the badge and that kind of thing. But related to what you do on our service, it's really about um, rewarding you with community. And it's interesting, we're still trying to figure out what the next steps are. Just last week, we had our first user who got to a million points. What do you do with that? I don't even know what he could have done to get to a million points. So we're still investigating that. The other thing is that um, there's, a guy, <laughs> there's a guy called Seasider who's in the UK and he works for the motorways. And um, he uses, he's an active Waze user. Somebody pinged him on Waze to let him know about an accident. It was a very, very bad accident. So he got there um, and he told me after that he got his Waze ping 10 minutes before it came into his control room and he believes he saved a life. So he got the first Waze Hero Award. But this is the kind of thing, also DJ talked about this, talked about empathy turning into action. Um, and it's at the very least information being able to be turned into action. So these things while we're building in fun, while, while they're cute things and points, it's again all about how are you creating real, real value. So in the future, um, so this, was, this is Waze and a Saab. Obviously, we're going to be in a number of cars in the, the coming year or two. Um, but you can apply that point system, that platform, uh, as, you, as, you, uh, as you grow as well. So for example, we can incentivize through tying into the car APIs things like better and more, uh, more, more green driving behavior. How fast do you decelerate? How fast do you accelerate? And we can start to incentivize those kinds of behaviors as well. This is what density looks like. <laughs> this is Waze data going back to one city uh, in one 24-hour period of time. This is not a road grid. This is everyone who's driving in LA for the single day. 
And the traces are left for the day. The uh, little, the, the pulses are the actual reports people make, and then those blobby, blobby glowy things are traffic jams. Now, you can see that it's 10 p.m. The city really starts to go to sleep, and you're getting a sense of the activity in the city. You can see the traces of the day. You can see that as we go into night, it's really uh, chit-chats. It's people uh, uh, reporting on police, right? There's not a lot of commute activity clearly happening at that, at that time, and it's, you know, it's kind of cool to see what's going on, but you can tell that the city is asleep. Then we hit 5 a.m., and you can start to see a little more traffic, you can see some more reports, and then you get to 6 a.m. and the city just bursts into life. This is only Waze data, one city, one day. And so these game mechanics for us are helping us get to critical mass and, and I think that we're pretty close to getting there. Thank you.